WKCR-FM 89.9, New York. Tonight, a special edition of Jockey Shorts. Well, I really season like the last two years <laughs> that I've been here is everybody has Penn and Princeton above us, but I really feel this year if we don't beat, I don't know, Penn and Princeton, that we're not going to have, you know, days of alibis are over. We have to beat them. I mean, that's all. <laughs> Can't say anything about, you know, we're better or anything like that, which we probably are, but... We just have to beat him. 16 seconds to go. Bird is still dribbling. Lewis comes up to challenge once again. Bird moves forward at the right side line. Now Bird moves to the foul line. Bird spins in the lane. Outside Kiner. Moves to the foul line. Left side bench. Long jump by Team Bench. It's good. Three seconds to go. All right, lose by two. And Princeton falls for time. Great start in the fourth quarter. Omochenko getting set to inbound. One second on the clock. Moving pass. Comes into Young. He goes up and off the rim. No good in the Lions win. It is all Columbia Lions has defeated the Princeton Tigers at Shadwin Gymnasium by the score of 38 to 36. Team best, 82% free throw shooter, bouncing the ball. First one up with the right hand, and it's good. The Lions lead by three with nine seconds to go. And the fans here are standing, waving their arms, and shouting, we're number one. And with only one timeout to go, Gene Benz looking to put the Lions up by four with nine seconds to go. Up with the right hand, it is good. And the Lions lead by four with nine seconds to go. Tommy Crowley will inbound it for Pennsylvania from side court with five seconds. He gets the ball, set to inbound, throws it into McDonald. Over his head, he grabs it. Long jump by McDonald, no good. Rebound, grab off the floor by three as time runs up, and that is it. The Columbia Lions have defeated the Pennsylvania Quakers at Levian Gymnasium. The first Columbia win over Pennsylvania in nine years. The first in 18 meetings. The final score, Columbia 88, Pennsylvania 84. The ball stolen by Free, drives the lane and stops. Mitchell drives to the lane, gives to Willite. He turns around with the layup is good. Oh, and I believe that's shot by Mike Willite. Mitchell cuts to his left, fires across the chest. Jazz into the lane, double pumps it up, and in for Steve Jazz. Coming to the middle, hit the bank shot. Best right side, the Dellin is into it, puts it up, and in. Beautiful play, and he was fouled. Jane dribbles to the foul line, gives off Ricky Frey. There's Dallin and McElhaney in the lane, turns one hand to hit the rebound, and... John McElroy brings the Lions off the bench. Alvin looks for the inbound step. Goes down one to Connor. He lays it up. It's good. Beautiful pass from Alvin. Made another assist to his old time team. Columbia record. Long jump. No good. Rebound cleared by Juan Mitchell. Goes ahead of the field to Bench. Bench catches up with it. Now he's missed by Roy. He lays it up. It's good. Team Bench catching him up to the ball ahead of the field. He's missed by Roy. Gave a fake hit. They shot Lions by nine. Rebound back tap taken by Jeff Coles. Got Mitchell ahead of the field. Gets the one and drives. And he turns. Left handed jam by Ron Mitchell. Bird dribbling between the circles against Calabrese. Moves to his left. Moves to the foul line. Down to the baseline. Drives the baseline. Layup is good. Alfred Bird taking it all by himself. Back when he looks side to Mitchell for the jump. It is good. Ron Mitchell red hot. He now has 16. Mitchell now left side. Tries to drive on Bruno. He's to the head of the circle. Holds up. Gives off best. Far side. He pops and hits. John cuts to the foul line. Spins around from Johnson, gets the cone, pulls up to the right to jump good. Jeff Combs on fire tonight. Right baseline, Coleman, his pass underneath is stolen by Jeff Combs. A lead pass down by the Ricky Free. He's ahead of the Philly Jams. First stuff of the year at home for the Lions, and Ricky Free loved it. Columbia Lions basketball, 1977-78. A year of excitement, a year of disappointment. A year of injuries, a year of accomplishment, a year of survival. Good evening, I'm Tom Mariam. For the first time in six years, Columbia entered a basketball season fresh from a winning season. The 1976-77 Lions won 16 of 26 and thrilled college basketball fans everywhere with the talents of people like Ricky Free and Alton Bird. But still, there was much uncertainty entering 77-78. The Lions were short in size and still had unconquered zone defenses. And what's worse... The, the schedule was seemingly concocted by someone who hated Columbia. Fifteen of the first 17 on the road. And with a schedule like that, Tom Penders and Shane Kotner were very cautious. 
Well, I think we're going to be a, a bit improved over last year. We're a year older. Um, we've got experience at just about every position. Um, I believe uh, we're, we have a great deal more maturity, but in terms of wins and losses, I just don't know because our schedule is much tougher, and uh, I believe that uh, we're going to have a, a tougher time earlier in the season this year because I don't believe we're going to surprise anybody like last year. We were able to sneak up on a few people. Well, our schedule is so tough this year. We've got a uh, 26-game schedule, and we're actually an underdog in about 16 games. I think it's important for us to be mentally ready uh, and realistic. Uh, we can't figure to have a great record coming out of December. Well, it uh, of course remains to be seen, but I, I see a very tough schedule at the beginning of the season, the first uh, 10 games or so. And any one of those games could go either way. We could uh, start out 2-8, and eight, we could start out 8-2. and two. The Lions did get a schedule break by opening up with Division III City College at the new Nat Holman Gymnasium. <laughs> there was no contest. Columbia 95, City 65. And while Juan Mitchell, Alton Bird, and company look just like their usual sharp selves of 1976-77, Shockley, who started for the Lions as a sophomore, took the 76-77 year off from school. He returned to score six points and grab seven rebounds and clog up the middle against the Beavers. The Lions and their followers were smiling. They might actually have a big man after all. At least that's what they thought. While City was an easy win for Columbia, Lafayette was not. The light blue needed an overtime to turn back the stubborn Leopards at 56-55. Now 2-0, emotions were running quite high on the Lions. And next up on the schedule was a date at Madison Square Garden against the Rutgers Scarlet Knights. The same Rutgers team Columbia had upset one year earlier at the barn in Rutgers in New Jersey. The Columbia team looked very forward to this ball game. They thought they could do it a second time. Rutgers, meanwhile, was looking for revenge against the Columbia Lions for not their loss of a year back. What's more, the Lions were looking to defend their 1976-77 New York-New Jersey 7 title. The Lions had captured that league with a 3-1 record, and the Scarlet Knights had finished with a very mediocre mark in the league. But with all the excitement going into the ball game, it didn't take long for it all to cool down. The Lions in the fourth quarter, Albert standing in front of the center, Jeff Snuckle, got Ricky Free to his right for the big front line, Jeff Snuckle to his left, Juan Mitchell deep left corner, Jake Tart in the right corner, and I'll tell you, they got the big view of the garden, and the crowd is going, but I can't blame it, because this is really boring, just to see the Lions hold the ball there. Eight and a half to go, it's still tied at 11, and Bird just holds the ball behind his back. And, and this has been going on for about three and a half minutes now. The Lions uh, have not even gotten the ball anywhere near the foul lane. And by 40 to go, we tied an 11 first step at the Garden. Bird with it, he's standing the circle to Mitchell. And he keeps back outside, just comes in front of the big court line. And we have now gone seven minutes without a point here at the Garden. And about seven minutes without a shot. Now uh, Coach Pendrick is motioning to the Lions that they do not seem to be coming out of this goal offense right now. Ricky Free with the ball, deep left side as the crowd is getting very restless here at the Garden. And the uh, stall now approaching 10 minutes with 2.40 remaining on the clock. We're still tied at 11. A James Bailey shot gave Rutgers the lead 13-11 at halftime, and in the second half the Lions had to abandon their four-corner freeze as they were trailing. But by then, their shooting had turned as cold as their offense, and James Bailey and Hollis Copeland became red hot. Down low to Bailey, the alley, and the bucket out of the foul, and James Bailey has just been eating up to the best right now. Anderson, head of the foul circle, spinning on Mitchell, brings it back outside. He's down low to Bailey, has the step, fires down low to Copeland, lays it in. The 62-48 loss had created a stir in New York college basketball circles. Why, they asked would a team freeze the ball in Madison Square Garden? What we were trying to do was just get them to come out, match up, and play man-to-man -man defense against us so that we could play a normal basketball game. Uh, with the height disadvantage that we had, uh, almost four inches a man, and uh, uh, that was our only, our only hope of, of playing. I thought we played in the second half and tried to get ahead, and of course we were playing against the zone the entire second half. We're not the world's greatest zone offensive team. We don't have the best outside shooting. Uh, we don't have the size to throw up second shots, and it was fairly evident what would have happened if we ran and, and played with Rutgers the entire game uh, with what happened in the second half. I believe that we would have lost by as much as 40 points if we attacked them. Two nights later, the Lions played their first home game of the season against the Manhattan Jaspers, 
a team they blew out by 28 points one year earlier. As with Rutgers, a year made a huge difference. Vance looking around for a teammate. Now dribbles to the foul line, gets to Free. Free spinning on Larry in the foul line. He slips, falls down, shovels the ball, and stolen by Larry. And out breaks down, four on two. A lead to Grant. He drives, lays it up and in. And a foul. Got the basket, and that's the big play of the game right here. Steve Grant's 32 points led the 91-80 overtime win for Manhattan, which was marked also by Alton Bird's foul troubles. The 5'8 and a quarter point guard sat out eight minutes of the second half with four personals, a stretch which saw Columbia outscore at 17 to 5. Although they didn't know it then, the Lions would have to learn to play without Alton Bird. Three nights later, the Lions traveled to Alumni Hall in Jamaica, Queens for the first time since their Ivy League playoff a decade ago. The opponent was the Red Men of St. John's, a team they hadn't faced in 10 years or since the finals of the, 70, of the 68 Holiday Festival, which Columbia had won. With all the nostalgia, Columbia led the 18th-ranked Redmen 29-27 at the half. But strong second-half performances by George Johnson and Rudy Wright lifted St. John's past Columbia 68-57 and dropped the Lions below 500 for the first time in 21 months. On to California, the home of Alton Bird. Now, I'm very excited about going home. It's the first time many of my people in San Francisco have been able to see me at home playing in front of my own people. It'll be a lot of fun for me, you know, more so than anything else. It'll be probably the highlight of my, my college career playing in front of my hometown folks. What Bird thought would be the highlight of his career turned out to be a genuine disaster for him as well as the Lions. California didn't start out badly for Columbia. The Light Blue's first opponent was a very strong Santa Clara team, one which had nearly upset UCLA at UCLA two weeks earlier. And for a while, it looked like Columbia would pull the upset. Bird now controls the ball outside for the Lions. Chavez picks him up, and a meeting man-to-man -man defense. Bird tries to go around Chavez, does not. Gives left side to Codner, inside to Wilhite. Wilhite tries to turn, banks up and in. Mike Wilhite from the left side on 12 feet. 30-20 Columbia lead, 4-19 to go in this half. But the Broncos didn't stay down for long, coming back on some incredible plays, like this one just before the half. Rebound, controlled by Malay with two. One, the best fires from one. The second half belonged to Santa Clara and Kurt Rambis, one of the better inside players in the country. The final, Santa Clara 72, Columbia 65. A respectable loss, but a loss. Besides their opponents, the Lions out west also had some other difficulties, namely getting used to Western officials. Bird to the top of the circle. Bird goes left side, banks it up. No good rebound. Kevin Best, no good for the whistle. Offensive, called an offensive foul. They also got a hometown job at Stockton, California, the home of the University of Pacific, where the Lions didn't even have a respectable loss. Bothered by good Pacific shooting, their own bad shooting, and the home court advantage of the Stockton Civic Center, Columbia fell 75-58. to At one point in the game, Pacific scored 17 in a row. Suddenly, the Lions had lost five straight games for the first time in two years. Columbia became a living example of Murphy's Law. Everything that could go wrong did. But things were to become worse, much worse. Assistant coach Buddy Mars' fearful prediction made in December came true. I mean, it's very unreasonable to think that he's going to go through three years of college ball without getting one injury. And the Lions are up by two, 20 to 18. Injury timeout on the court. Alton Bird shaking up. Lee Rainfield, as you said, is working uh, with his left, uh, right leg right now, I believe. Or it's his left leg. And we really don't have any idea what's going on out there with Alan Burr, but that would be a serious blow to the Lions. We know he controls the whole offense for them, and uh, whether they could withstand that loss right now would uh, be very bad. And Alton is being li lifted from the court. This apparently is a little more seriously than we thought because he's going to get some help from Lee Raisfeld and the trainer from San Francisco State. And the Lions point guard and leader had suffered a severely sprained left ankle. It would be five weeks before he would again put on uniform number 13 for the light blue. Perhaps the greatest tragedy of the injury was that it happened during Bird's homecoming. The native San Franciscan had waited three years to play college ball in his hometown, and now after only eight minutes, Alton Bird's friends and family 
how to watch a Columbia team without Bird. In addition to Bird, Juan Mitchell and Mike Wilhite also were playing before their hometown folks in San Francisco. And they too, like Bird, got hurt, although fortunately for the Columbia Lions, neither one was seriously injured. Besides all the injuries, Columbia also had four players foul out and finished the 71-69 defeat with but one substitute available, he being Jay Cutlow, who had seen less than a minute of varsity action at that point. The Lions had reached the bottom. Six straight defeats, an injury to Alton Bird, and a loss to a relatively poor Division III school. Tom Penders lectured the team for an hour following the game. To start 1978, the Lions gladly left California for Tulsa, Oklahoma, and Oral Roberts University. Oral Roberts is noted for healing, but the Lions' wounds deepened in a 66-60 defeat, number seven in a row. For the fourth straight game on the trip, a Lion first-half lead virtually evaporated before halftime. On to St. Louis, where Shane Kotner grew up. I'm really looking forward to it. I think, uh, I think St. Louis may have forgotten about me and about Jeff Combs, and we'd like to reintroduce ourselves to St. Louis. Playing against the Billikens of St. Louis University in his hometown, Jeff Combs made sure he, if not Shane Cotner too, would be long remembered. Left side, Cotner drives baseline, fakes the shot back to Mitchell on the left wing. Mitchell, top of the circle, Combs fires and hits Jeff Combs. And Free brings it up himself, now crosses the uh, center court line, goes to the top of the circle to set things up, gives to Combs now. Combs left wing to Mitchell, Mitchell holds, fakes, now drives inside, fakes the shot back to Combs, fires from 20, the shot is good. Jeff Combs hits from outside again. To Frazier, double team by Mitchell Combs. Out to car, 25 footer for the right, no good long. Ricky Free grabs the rebound. Outlet to Jeff Combs. He's ahead of the field on the drive. He lays it in. And a foul. Mitchell goes down low to Combs. He turns, he lays it in. Jeff Combs off the pass for Juan Mitchell. Has tied it at 58. 19 points for Jeff Combs. And what a homecoming this has been for Jeff Combs. And trailing 65-63 in the dying seconds, the Lions needed a tying basket. And who did they go to? The hometown hero. 13 seconds to go. The Lions come on the basketball court with Jeff Combs and Gene Betts, Ricky Free, Kevin Best, and Mike Wallheim. They have a lot of shooters in there, a small club and a quick one. St. Louis goes with Shavers, Glass, Johnson, Jackson, and Fraser. That is their biggest ball club. Inbounds to Betts. He lets it roll until it crosses the court. And he gets to Mike Wilhite left side with Terrence the back. Out to Wilhite in the left corner. Back outside to Combs. Head of the foul circle. Long jump. Quick. The Lions are tied at 65. Five seconds to go. Jackson in the backcourt. He gives it up. But the shaver and that is it. We go to overtime. Jeff Combs ties it up with five seconds to go. 21 points to 196 for Jeff Combs. The Lions come back to their bench ecstatic. The ecstasy didn't last long, though, for the Lions. One and one for Jackson, two for three from the line tonight. Here's the foul shot, no good. Rebound, tipped around, Fraser grabs it again. But St. Louis, he turns, jump shot, good. 70, 265, St. Louis. That might have been the ball game. It was the ball game and the trip. Columbia returned to New York 0 for 5 in their cross-country excursion without Alton Bird and with eight straight losses, and also with a 2-8 and eight record. Was the season over? Realistically, uh, the most important part of our schedule is the Ivy League. Well, I still feel that the top two teams in the league are Princeton and Penn. Uh, Penn, uh, since I've been at Columbia, has had by far the best talent in the league. They, you know, they, they at one time can have uh, three high school Americans on the floor, and for an Ivy League team, that's unusual. I feel, though, for the first time uh, since I've been here, I, I felt that last year we might surprise people, but this year I feel that we are capable of upsetting one of those two teams. I don't think in any way, uh, shape, or form can we be considered a favorite, but I do look at us as a first division team, uh, a team that should get better with the, with the season. On Friday the 13th of January, Columbia opened its Ivy season with a 74-56 whipping of Cornell. The losing streak suddenly became a winning streak as the Lions ripped off road wins at Cornell, Fordham, and Yale. But at Brown, the streak stopped, thanks to two players who wouldn't even last the season for the Bruins. Quickly into the forecourt. Moss gives it into the lane. Down low to Hanif. Jump is good. Aza Hanif with a short five-foot jump, putting it off the glass. Left side for Sweetser. Combs is on him. They give it right side again for Rose. His 20-foot pop is good. And Brown will just not give up. The Lions had to play the entire month of January without Alton Bird, and they never gave up. They emerged with a 4-3 and three record, but as February arrived, 
So did Alton Bird return. As far as Bird is concerned, I've said it a number of times, I don't think there's a better offensive point guard in the country. He does so many things for us. I don't know how we were competitive without him. Uh, let's hope we can become a better basketball team now that he's back with us. Indeed, Columbia was much improved with Bird back. His first half of basketball at Princeton proved his value to the team. One bounce pass to Ricky Free, moving against Roman. Now he moves through the lane. The layup is good at the whole hole. And he's fouled. Reiner back outside, almost taken with five. Over there, loose the move. Loses the ball to Mitchell. Down court to Coons with two. Layup is good at the buzzer. Coombs hitting on the ahead of the field pass from Juan Mitchell off the steal from Bill Omel Seco, and the Lions bring a three-point lead into the dressing room at halftime, 20 to 17. To show the disbelieving fans that the first half was not a fluke, Columbia dominated the opening of the second session. Three at the high post against Roma, he turns, looks for a cutter, now dribbles against Roma to the baseline, he faced, gives that little cut, the driving shot is good, and a foul! And one as Jay Condon will go to the line of the Lions by seven, and they are looking very impressive tonight. Kleiner to that in the key, outside Lewis, a six for a guard, and they are many of those in the Ivy League. Just download a Roman shot, no good, rebound, Roman, no good, rebound, Kalinski, no good, rebound, top the round, no good, still Lewis in a stand by Ricky Frey. And he just protects the ball, gives an arrogant look down court of Princeton, and hands down for Bird against Frizzetto at center court. Dribbles to the left and then cuts back to his right. Goes down the right, running back is up and The Lions by 10, 29-19. As brilliant as the offense and rebounding were, the defense stood out. Juan Mitchell didn't score a basket for the Lions against the Tigers, but he made sure Princeton wouldn't either. He moves along the right side, a slow down, stolen by Kowitski. I hit the Lewis, Lewis ahead of the field, knocked away by Mitchell, and off, Princeton and out of bounds. Beautiful defensive play by Juan Mitchell getting back and knocking it off the foot of John Lewis. And the Lions will have it in the backcourt. Columbia hadn't defeated Princeton in 12 games dated back to 1972. Princeton was not about to let the streak halt. The whiskey comes in the lane, stops, forces the jump good. The Lewis, up top, Omel Sickle, pulls up from 20, the jump good. No Omel Sickle from the top of the key. He now has six of the Lions leaders, cuts the three, 29-26. Although Senko looks to go into the lane to corner. One bounce pass in the corner to Sawinski. He spins now, beats the line, jumps, it's in. Mike Sawinski from 15 feet out on the baseline, and that cuts the lead to one, 29-28. Just as in the Rutgers upset of last season, when Princeton came close, the Lions moved away. Ricky Free at center court, looking to move against Roma. Now he holds, gives back outside to Benz. Cross court to Alton Bird, and Bird will control it once again with four and a half to go in the game. Princeton fans are booing, but it's effective. Now Bird goes down the lane. What do you want? Hit it good. <laughs> Alton Bird moves into the lane for the running one hand. It was good. He now has eight points. And as Princeton moves to the fourth court, they call for time. And the Columbia fans on their feet once again. 422 remaining in the ball game. Alliance lead the Princeton Tigers 34 to 30. 34-30 Columbia, 4.22 to go. It would be quite a while before the scoreboard would change due to a most unusual delay. Now a bit of a delay, as apparently there was a problem with the public address, and now an announcement is being made to the crowd. And now there's a report of a bomb scare in Princeton Jadwin Gymnasium at the moment, and apparently the game is going to be stopped. People are going to be asked to leave, and uh, we're going to stay right here for as long as we can. There has been a report of a bomb scare in Jadwin Gymnasium just now being reported to the feds, and everybody is getting up and being asked to leave. The bomb threat proved to be a dud. The rest of the game was not. 16 seconds to go. Bird still dribbling. Lewis comes up to challenge once again. Bird moves forward. At the right sideline. Now Bird moves to the foul line. Bird spins in the lane. Outside Kiner. Moves to the foul line. Left side Bent. Long jump by Gene. Bent is good. Three seconds to go. All right, lead by two. And Princeton calls for time. With two seconds to go in the ball game. Gene Bent with a 25 footer from the left side. And the Lions lead the Princeton Tigers. 38 36. Late side in the fourth court. Almost Shanko getting set to end that. One second on the clock. Moving pass, comes in to Young, he goes up and off the rim. No good, and the Lions win. It is all over. It is all over. The Columbia Lions have defeated the Princeton Tigers at Chadwin Gymnasium. 
by the score of 38 to 36. All year, the Lions have been quite a loose bunch, despite their many losses. Game winner Gene Bence relates why. What happened during the interlude while the arena was evacuated? What did you guys do? Uh, we just went down to the edge, you know, told a couple of jokes, you know, kept our good humor as usual. The Princeton win was marked by 60% field goal shooting, and of the Lions' 15 field goals, 12 were layups. Frank Sowinski, normally a 60% shooter himself, was just 3 out of 13. Coach Prenders called the win over Pete Carrill the highlight of his coaching career. On to Philadelphia went the Lions, just a game behind the league-leading Quakers. The impossible dream of a road sweep over Princeton and Penn ended convincingly. A 21-20 Lion lead became a 49-21 deficit as the Quakers amazingly ran off 29 straight points in a 13-minute span. When it did end, Penn had an 81-58 victory and a two-game Ivy League lead. The ancient eight race was over, so they said. The Palestra affair ended Columbia's long skein of road games, though. After 15 of 17 away from Levian, the next five would be on Morningside Heights. Home was indeed sweet for Columbia. First, the Lions sleepwalked by Dartmouth 62-58, and then they blasted Harvard 71-62. Columbia was suddenly fighting to become a 500 ball club. I feel that uh, I don't really think I'm an enforcer on a team. I feel that if more people would be that way, because we're small and we get pushed around, so when people start to take advantage of us, you know, we all have to rally together. And so that doesn't happen because if it gets to a pushing match or something like that, when, you know, people, we're going against people 6'10", you know, 6'8", we're going to come out on the short end of the stick. Shane Cotner, head of the foul circle. Loops down little Mitchell, gets the step, drives the shot, rejected by Scott and taken off by Tides. He runs it, the calls and a whistle as Tides goes crashing to the floor and a foul is called. And now Tides and Combs start to throw one another. Here comes Shane Cotner. Roy Mitchell comes in and grabs Tides. The Wild Scott getting involved with Mitchell. And Scott and Mitchell keep having words. Buddy Moore coming over. Mike Williams holding off the line players. Shane Cotner getting involved. Roy Mitchell getting involved right here in front of the broadcast booth. Scott being held off as security comes on the court. Lee race fell the Lion trainer holding back Mitchell. Tides winds up three rows back in the crowd. And now they're being separated. And finally, the players begin to move over to their bench. What happened with that scuffle out there? What was the uh, cause of it? Well, I didn't see it. It happened over here, and I was out of bounds. I think I was going after the ball or something. I just looked around, and one of the guys was swinging at our guys, so I ran over there, and they had broke it up. Then uh, Tynes was leaving, and he pushed somebody. So, you know, I grabbed him, and then the big guy swung at me and missed, and there was a whole lot of stuff, but nobody really got hit. The fight occurred on St. Valentine's night in the Seton Hall game. Combs and Tynes were ejected, but the bat woke up the light blue. Regulation time ended at 69 all. Overtime ended in the Lions' favor. Mobs at center court against Gene Bentz. Beats stuff on the left sideline. Drives around Cotton to the baseline. For the jump, and it's up. No good. Rebound. Richard Trey leads Mitchell. Driving ahead of the field against Davis. He lays it up and in. Beautiful pass from Free to Mitchell. Took it all the way. 18 for Mitchell. The Lions by three. 74-71. And what boy did that fight help Juan Mitchell tonight. Bird in dribbling exhibition against Davis. Tries the baseline. Gets the kind of driving hook guard. Beautiful pass by Alton Bird. Bird, stutter step move outside the key with a minute and seven to go. Dribbles away from Davis. Hands the cop there. He fumbles but recovers. Back to Bird at the center jump circle. Stutter step move on Davis as we go under a minute to go. Bird now tries in the lane. Running one-hander is good. The first field goal of the night for Alton Bird. By 78-74. Columbia had finally reached the 500 mark again. 10 and 10, and best of all, 6 and 2 in the Ivy League. The Lions got revenge over Brown 75-70 at Levian. Hanif and Rhodes, the villains of the first match, were now ineligible to play due to academic troubles. The 9 of 11 streak was marked by some great individual performances. Mike Wilhite had 28 points in the Brown loss. Ricky Free scored 24 at Yale, and Juan Mitchell rammed home 23 at Fordham but they all paled when compared to Shane Kotner's performance against the Yale Bulldogs. Well, this time I'd like to be a little less steady and per perhaps more productive because, uh, I don't know, I've always thought steady was just a, a way of saying, uh, you know, not that flashy and, and, and not that productive, but uh, not, that, not making that many mistakes. I'd like to contribute a little bit more this year and, and try to do away with that adjective of steady.
I think when Tom Penders talked to Shane Cotner a moment ago, he was telling him how many points he needed for 30. Yeah! Shane Cotner on the rebound, puts it through. You heard the yell in the background. And that was a big basket for Cotner. And uh, the players going over to the sidelines and a big uh, hand being given to the uh, players. Tom? And I think the hand is especially for Shane Cotner as it looks like Tom Penders has brought him out of the ball game. He has been replaced by John Magdalene. Cotner sits down with 30 points, 10 field goals in 15 tries, 10 foul shots, and 12 attempts. Just a great ball game for Shane Cotner. How conscious were you in the second half of your point total? Well, I knew exactly what I had. <laughs> and I must admit that. I knew what I had. The 88-71 win gave Columbia an 8-2 Ivy mark and a renewed life in the ancient eight. Harvard, 90. The Harvard upset pulled the Lions to within one game of Penn. Back to the road, though. If Columbia could sweep Dartmouth and Harvard away, they would meet Penn at home for the first place in the Ivy League. Suddenly, the season became most interesting. It became even more interesting when the New York Post broke a back-page story saying that Coach Tom Penders was the leading candidate for the head job at Fordham. The rumors did not seem to bother the Lions. They took Dartmouth by 17 and ran away from Harvard by 24. For the first time in seven years, Columbia had swept her weekend on the road in the Ivy League. Besides beating Dartmouth and Harvard, the Lions had some other business to take care of in New England. And Jay Cutlow has come in the game along with Brian Sindor. Robertson's pass is stolen by Jeff Combs. 19 seconds left. The Lions breaking down court. Passes off on the left for Schatz. Underneath for Cutlow. Lays it up and in! Jay Cutlow is first to point to the Columbia Varsity Lions. And the Lions are up on the bench ecstatic for Jay's first point. <laughs> Yes, it was a big basket. Coach Penders designed a play that it would be weaving and bobbing, and the ball would get to me, and I scored. It's just the start of something big. While Cutlow may have started something big for himself, Alton Bird was in the process of finishing something even bigger. Mitchell quickly back court the other way with the 10 footer. He hits it, and Columbia leads it 20 to 9. And John, I think Alton Bird with that pass is just tied to this month for a lion career with 316. Glenn Fine feeds Allen in the corner, and he pumps in a jump shot. And now Columbia leads it by 11. Fast quick to Mitchell under the basket, plays it up and in. Juan Mitchell ahead of the field there. Gives Columbia an 11-point lead, and Alton Bird hit him beautifully on the fast break. The cable car connection works to perfection. And now they have announced that to the crowd. Alton Bird has indeed set the career record for assists by a Columbia Lion, surpassing Elliot Wolf, who set his mark in 1968, 69, and 70. And Alton Bird, he did it again, this time the career assist record. I think it's a real honor, you know, it, 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 it's something you can't do alone, obviously. Uh, I know at halftime, I thank everybody on my team for uh, at least catching the free, you know, it makes a hell of a lot of difference when you got guys who can shoot the ball and they're so receptive to your passes and my teammates have been ready, you know, all the time. So it's a tribute to him, a tribute to them. And uh, Mr. El Mr. Mr. Wolf is listening. You know, I'm sorry I broke your record, but that's the way it goes. Bring on the Quakers. Columbia 10-2 and in the Ivy League, Penn at 11-1. The Lions winners of seven in a row and 12 out of 14. A sellout crowd at Levy and Jim greeted Columbia as it had everything it wanted. A win against Penn and a duplicate accomplishment the next evening against Princeton, and the Lions would be Ivy League champions. And the big weekend began very nicely for the home team. He plays it back outside, Bird. Penn in the 2-3 zone against the Lion offense right now. Bird at the top. One half, Cotner, right sideline. Goes to the middle to free. Jumps over White and hits. First field goal of the night. The Lions up by three. Three step. Three and a half gone by. Four court. Double team by free. It comes. Is a behind the back pass. The price goes to McDonald, 12 footer for the right switch. First field goal for Penn, and it's a 3 2 game in favor of the Columbia Lions. Bird right, pulls up for 20. Long jump, good. Lions recapture the lead at 5 4. Bird will bring it up himself against, against Bobby Willis with the left hand. Cuts to the foul line. Weaves his way back to the line to Mitchell. Open for 20. Here's the shot. It is up good. And back and forth, we see so on the Lions by 1 13 12. Six minutes gone by. Bird to the foul line, fast for the jump. He's the front of the rim, bounce home. Lions by three, big lead of the night for them. 
15, 12, 13, 38 to go. First half, Soldiers with a steady step move, moves it across the mid-court line. To McDonald, double team to the right corner. He plays back outside Soldiers. Back to McDonald, moves against Mitchell. Whistle, traveling a call against Kevin McDonald. And now Pennsylvania making some costly turnovers. And turnovers which haven't really been forced either. Bird across the divider to Cotner in front of the pen bench. Goes down low to Bird. Fakes on Soldiers, spins away. Now turns for the fadeaway. Jump good. Out Bird posted. James Soldiers hit the jump the Lions by 5, 17, 12. Eight points for Out Bird. Kevin McDonald on the left side to the left corner. Matt White played by Freakus. Outside Green throws it away. Look for McDonald's and City through to the press table. Cotner guarded by McDonald to the right side to Jeff Combs, Hawk by Stan Green, two seniors playing against one another for the last time. Down low to Mitchell, turn around, jump over, white guard. 19-12, Columbia, Juan Mitchell has uh, seven points, and the two San Franciscans with 15 of the Lions 19. The cable car connection got some help from Ricky Free, Gene Vence, Mike Wilhite, Shane Kotner, and the rest of the Lions as they broke to a big first half lead. Holding for the last shot of the half, Altenberg put it in the face of the Lions' number one enemy, Penn's Tom Crowley. 13 seconds to go. Bull right on the left. Now nine seconds to go as Bird gets it back to the foul line. Stops and jumps and hits. Four seconds to go. Price looking to inbound. Gets it in so Smith gives to Crowley in midcourt as the brothers sound. So that's the end of the first half. Ryan held for one shot. Alton Bird hitting the jump shot from the foul line with nine with four seconds to go. Giving the Lions their biggest lead of the first half at halftime. The Columbia Lions leading the Pennsylvania Quakers 49 to 40. If the first half were noisy, the second half began with a loud bang. Up to Willis, he's playing with three personal fouls as we open up this second half with the Lions on top by nine. Left corner goes to Kevin McDonald, moves to the baseline, stops for the jump, it is no good. Rebound back tap taken by Jeff Combs. He's got Mitchell in the field. Gets the one, he drives, and he jumps. Left-handed chair by Juan Mitchell. The Lions by 11, 51 of 40. Penn, though, had won 17 straight from the Lions, and like Princeton the month before, the Quakers were not about to go down easily to see their dominance end over the Columbia Lions. Tony Price and Matt White, a pair of juniors, led the comeback. Price in the right corner, out to Willis to the top of the green. Green moves against Combs, does not have any room. To the foul line, Price, turn around, jump good. Willis gets the Price against Cotton, moves in the lane, stops, short bank good. Inbound to Price, turn around, bank good. Down low Price, triple team, he turns. Still looking for an outlet, finds right underneath, he tries, scoop his guard. The foul line to Smith, goes back down on a white turn around, bank is around the rim and drops in. And a Penn player sleep off the bench as they have cut the lead down to one. 61 is 60, 11, 35 to go. When Columbia last beat Pennsylvania, most of the Lions on the team now were in the sixth grade. Ricky Free, Juan Mitchell, Alton Bird, Shane Cotner, and Gene Bentz have grown up quite a bit since then. Bird across midcourt with a right hand dribble. Out back in and gets Salter to the left sideline. Holds up, now to free at the high post. Spins against Smith to the baseline. He turns, head fake. Now the jump shot. Good. Ricky Free putting it in from 12. Ricky looked very sure on that shot. 63 60 the Lions again by three. Price, bothered by Mitchell. He spins away from one to the baseline. Stops for the jump. Short rebound, Gene Betts. Protects the basketball and then dribbles it up himself for the Lions. Ahead to Bird. Out, accelerates to the top of the key. Dribbling against Salty. Goes down with Mitchell. Turns, hooks that good. Beautiful pass. By Alton Bird, and even a prettier shot by Juan Mitchell. Bench inbounds it to Bird at center court against Salter. The left corner, Mitchell, open from 20. He sets it, he shoots, and he hits. Juan Mitchell having a game of his year, of his year at least. Maybe even the game of his career. 67-60, Columbia scores six straight after Penn pulls it within one. Outside to free, left side to Mitchell. Hits to the shot, waits the 20, but it is good. Juan Mitchell, red hot. Now the Bird looks for a pass, throws down court bench, two on one. Bench in the lane, throws left side, Mitchell stops and jumps and hits. Juan Mitchell with 24, he has been amazing. 73, 66, 820 to go. Gene Benz with eight points thus far tonight. First trip to the line for the 82% free throw shooter. Takes a lot of time. Puts the first one up with the right hand, and it is off the back of the rim. No good, and that's through. And it's the night of the Lions. That one hit the back of the rim, bounced to the height of the top of the backboard, came down and dropped cleanly through the hoop. Ricky Free in the fourth court at the high post. Free looks through against Matt White, who's guarding him. Free fakes on White. Now the jump is good. Ricky Free hits the shot. No foul was called. He wanted one. 
Ricky Free and Tony Fresh, old rivals from high school, both freshman ball, and now they're both juniors, and they're still going at it. Lions by two, 82-80, 226 to go. Here it comes, tap, control by Pennsylvania. Hillis at the side of the lane. He backs up between the circles with 222 to go. Pennsylvania can tie right here for the first time in a long time. Crowley goes to McDonald on the left side. He throws to the baseline to Price. He turns, 10 footer is off the window. Good. Rebound great by Ricky Free. Big rebound right there for the Columbia Lions. 207 to go. Free hands to Bird and he starts out. Alton Bird looking to move against Bobby Willis, who's back into the game for Pennsylvania. Willis, excuse me, Bird moves to the top of the key. Bird to the right sideline. Bird still spinning against Willis Kisser to the corner of the bench. Gene Bentz brings it back outside. Gene Bentz in his last weekend as a Columbia basketball player. Gives on the left side to Shane Conner. Conner gives on the left to Flea. Flea looks to drive to the baseline. Now gives off Mitchell. Oh, it's good! Ricky Flea fighting on Mitchell Open. He has a career high 29 points. Lions by 484 80, a minute and a half to go. A minute and 11 to go. Outside Crowley pulls up 25. Footer is off the window. Good. He's got great by Ricky Flea. Lions with a four point lead in the ball. A minute four to go. Gene Bates to the fourth turn and he slows it up. Bates looks for someone to pass to get off free at the foul line. Free moves to the right side. Right goes back outside out to Bird. Under a minute to go. 55 seconds. Bird between the circles at the line. Fans stand up and cheer at the right side. Bates. Bates goes back to Alton Bird. Bird moving between two men. Putting out a dribbling exhibition. He's fouled by Bobby Willis. And the fans here jumping up and down, waving their arms. The Lions with a four-point lead, 44 seconds to go. Alton Bird has handed the ball, and the Olivian crowd quiets down. Alton Bird gets set for the first. It's up with the right hand, and it's good. Lions with a five-point lead, 85-80, 44 seconds to go. Bird on the line for the second. Gets set for it, up with the right hand, and it's good. Lions by six, 86-80. Bird dribbling it slowly on the line. Gets set for the first, it is off the back of the window. Good rebound grabbed by Tony Price, and the Quakers still have a shot. Gives it off to Willis. Willis moves it across midcourt with 20 seconds to go. To the left side of the lane, into the corner with 18. Outside Crowley with 16. Into the corner, Willis, long jump, it's good. Bobby Willis cutting it to two with 12 seconds to go. Keen Betts, 82% free throw shooter, bouncing the ball. First one, up with the right hand, and it's good. The Lions lead by three with nine seconds to go. And the fans here are standing, waving their arms, and shouting, we're number one. And with only one timeout to go, Gene Betts looking to put the Lions up by four with nine seconds to go. Up with the right hand, and it's good. And the Lions lead by four with nine seconds to go. Tommy Crowley will inbound it for Pennsylvania from side court with five seconds. He gets the ball, set to inbound, throws it into McDonald, over his head, he grabs it. Long jump by McDonald, no good. Rebound, grabbed off the four by three as time runs up, and that is it. The Columbia Lions have defeated the Pennsylvania Quakers at Levy and Gymnasium. The first Columbia win over Pennsylvania in nine years. The first in 18 meetings. The final score, Columbia 88, Pennsylvania 84. The Lions are tied for the Ivy League lead. Penn and Columbia, 11-2, one game remaining. The Quakers had to travel to Cornell to play the Big Red of the Cornell University. They had lost to them the year before up at Barton Hall. Meanwhile, Princeton had to move from Ithaca to Levian for a blizzard for a season-ending showdown with the Lions. The Penn game dominated the sports pages of all three New York's major newspapers. Morningside Heights had become a huge party, and excitement had once again gripped the Columbia campus. Another capacity crowd filled Levy and Jim for the Princeton game. And while the 3,400 fans sensed an Ivy League title, Princeton smelled something else. Omar Chico gives to Lewis at midcourt, and he moves it across against Byrne. Goes into the corner of the corner, and he drives the baseline, stops, goes outside to Roma. To the top to Omar Chico, left side to Lewis, he drives, stops, one-handed, no good. Rebound off the hands of free, grabbed by Lewis, he drives, no good. Rebound grabbed by Roma, and he lays it home. And the Lions being completely dominated off the boards, first to getting offensive rebound after offensive rebound. And the Tigers have a three-point lead, 12-9. Lewis down to the high post, Roma played by free left corner. So it's over for 25 jump, no good. Rebound tip by Roma, no good. Rebound Roma, he turns, lays it in. 19-9, Princeton on top. Sowinski drives to the foul line against Mitchell. Jump pass over to Omocheco, and he returns to Sowinski. High post, it goes to Young, turn around, jump good. 
Tommy Young picking up where Bob Roble left off. Ricky Free right corner. Free right back to the top. Will Hike goes to the free on the right side. Like cutting Gene Benz in the lane. He turns, puts up a force bank shot. No good. Rebound tip. No good. Rebound taken by Frank Sawinski. Throws it out with Bob Mochenko. Races against Will Hike. Gets by him. Cuts in the lane. Scoop shot up. No good. Rebound taken by Young. He turns, lays it in, and a foul. I left corner Kleiner. He dribbles it back outside. Goes down low to Young. He turns on free for the jump shot. Good. Too tall, Young with nine points, a minute to go first half, and Princeton leads it by 9.30, The Tiger Big Men were just too dominant for the Lions. Roma and Young were unstoppable inside, and John Lewis and Rob Kleinert were unbeatable outside. The Lions also compounded their problems with 36% field goal shooting against the Tigers, compared to 64% the night before against Penn. And as Princeton was running away with the second half against the Lions, Penn was pulling away from Cornell. Levian's dream ended in tears. And Frank Sawinski is being helped to the locker room by two of his Princeton teammates. The crowd at Levian gives him a big ovation. They also give Ricky Free a standing ovation as he leaves the ball game. This is the last we'll see of Ricky Free for 1977-78. Once again, the Lions leader in scoring and rebounding. He'll be back for one more year, and I'm sure Ricky Free is looking forward to next year right now. Certainly the Lions have nothing else to look forward to but next year. And Altenberg also sitting down. Altenberg with his head, head in his hands on the bench, almost in tears. In fact, he is in tears right now. As you can see, the pain of this loss has gotten to him as well as to Ricky Free as Kleiner hits on the first. 58-40. Altenberg just cannot believe what happened tonight. The Lions questioning themselves as Kleiner hits the second, 59-40. The 59-44 final, along with Penn's 98-74 thrashing of Cornell, gave the Quakers the Ivy League title by a game over both Columbia and Princeton. Still, the Lions had little to be sad over. The 11-3 mark was their best in the Ivy since 1970, and the same was true of the eight-game win streak and the second-place league finish. Their 13-16 of 16 end ending was also the school's best since the days of Jim McMillan and Hayward Dotson. Perhaps the highest compliment paid the Lion team was by Fordham University, which hired Tom Penders as coach just a day and a half after the Princeton game. Ironically, the Fordham job became vacant the day after Columbia downed the Rams in January. Looking back, though, on the 77-78 season, the Lions have no regrets. Alton Bird, Jeff Combs, and Gene Schatz all feel it was a success. Very successful. Uh, it, was, it was a season that, despite the injuries and the sicknesses we had, very, very close. Uh, you know, it was one I enjoyed. Being incapacitated, you know, people might not understand how, but I enjoyed it, even on crutches in the snow and falling down. It was something I enjoyed. I enjoyed every t everybody on the team's personality to the utmost. And it was a situation that I felt very comfortable in. You know, I'm pretty sure everybody else felt very comfortable in. And, uh, you know, Hell, we started out two and eight, we finished fifteen and eleven, and you know we finished strong. So I, I think it was probably a more successful year than than my sophomore year, you know, seventy six, seventy seven, and that we finished strong, and you know we finally learned what it takes to be a winning program consistent. I think it was a great year for, in terms of the team. You know, we started off, well, you know, we started off slow. We. Uh, I don't know how, if we were playing that bad or if it was just the competition that we hit right away before the team was able to gel. And then, uh, of course, Alton getting hurt didn't help things at all. But, uh, you know, I think that uh, that injury to Alton made everybody else pull together that much harder and work that much harder so that when he came back, we had matured somewhat and uh, were playing even better than we were when he, you know, as a team and when he had left. I think it was a very successful and exciting season, both for the fans and the players. Uh, we definitely had our high points and our low points. We were 2-8 and eight at the beginning of the year, and we ended up 15-11 and 11 and, uh, you know, fighting for the Ivy League title. And, you know, we lost to teams like San Francisco State and all Roberts, which never should have happened, but we beat some good teams, Penn, Princeton, and Seton Hall. And uh, I, think you have to, I think you have to measure a team... Uh, and more than just wins. These were a very close team. We stayed together throughout the year, even though we did have some injuries and uh, some speculation about uh, Coach Penders leaving. The Western trip, despite the five losses, also had its virtues. The team became very close and suffered the adversity together. There was never a hassle during the whole losing streak. They learned a bit, and they enjoyed themselves as well. A learning experience, you know, something that... that helped us mature, you know, quite a bit. You, know, you lose five in a row, and 
most people would say, well, let's pack it in, folks, you know, but, um, we hung in there, we said, hey, just because we lost eight in a row, it doesn't mean the season's over, we're looking towards Ivy's, and as it ended up, that's exactly what happened, you know, we, we should have beat, you know, you always say we should have beat uh, Santa Clara, because we had them down 12, uh, we should have beat San Francisco State, you know, but I got hurt, you know, we should have beat Oral Roberts, but so-and-so, and we should have beat St. Louis, and we, but we only took five shots, so, there's a lot of should have been, but, you know, well, it didn't happen, you know, and it wasn't in the books for us. Well, there's no way you can term it a success, uh, but I did feel that in probably four of the five games we played very good basketball. Uh, we were badly outmatched in just about every game in terms of talent and size, but I thought our players uh, played pretty well. Well, it was disappointing not winning, but I managed to have a good time anyway, and I think the whole team did. We stayed together. Everybody managed to really enjoy themselves on the uh, Western trip. Some of the times, though, were not that good. Shane Cotner and Juan Mitchell laugh now at what were the year's low points. The low point of the year uh, would have to be the loss to San Francisco State. They're they're just a pathetic team. They they couldn't beat uh, they couldn't beat City College. They couldn't beat Wagner. They couldn't beat any of the teams around here, and they beat us. <laughs> I don't really see any low points in the season. Just looking back. Now, I guess the lowest point to me was the Brown game. <laughs> that, was, that was definitely it, you know. If it wasn't that game, who knows, you know, what we'd be playing. We would have played and we would have known, you know, where we'd be going or what. The Lions may argue what was their low point of the season, but there's no question about what was the year's high point. For me, it had to be last Friday, you know, beating Penn. It was the first time I had ever beaten them uh, it was the first time that I, and I really didn't do it, but it was the first time that I had a chance to rub it in their faces like they rubbed it in ours, you know, for so long. And it's probably the best feeling I've had since I've been here, you know, just to beat them. If I didn't do anything else last year, I wanted to beat them, you know. And I finally, we finally done it, and, you know, hey, it was a good feeling. It was a highlight of the season. I really think it was the victory over, the, over Pennsylvania. Um, it far outshadowed uh, any individual performance, and uh, I also felt that uh, it was it was a bigger thrill than, the, than our victories over Princeton and Seton Hall. The Pennsylvania game, where we had capacity crowds, the people yelling and screaming, myself, I I really enjoy seeing a lot of people having fun at the games, and it pumps me up as well as well as the players, and I know the fans enjoyed it, and I really enjoyed it. Myself. The 1977-78 Lions season, like most, was one of what-ifs. What if Rhodes and Hanif had not played the first Brown game and Bird did? What if the Lions didn't lose eight in a row on the road? And what if Bird hadn't been hurt? When Alton went down, Shane Cotner saw a bright side to the injury, but Mike Wilhite tells us the overall effect. Who knows, it, it may be a blessing in disguise because uh, it's easy to use Alton as a crutch uh, because he can do so many different things and, and you, the other players can get by. Uh, without doing some things on their own. Uh, his absence, since it won't be for the entire season, uh, it might help us out because everybody will, will learn to play a little harder, a little better, and then when he comes back, hopefully for the Ivy League season, we might be a better team. That hurt. That really hurt. Uh, we lost the ball handling, the skills of uh, him moving the team, and it kind of hurt us. It really hurt us. What if Elmer Love, the Lions star of the past two seasons, came back to Columbia for 77-78? And what if Ed Shockley didn't drop off the team? Well, those are two tough losses, you know. Those, Elmer was, like, probably the most integral part of our team. You know, he was steady. He knew what he had to do. We knew what he, we had to get from him to win. And, uh, you know, it it hurt us quite a bit when we when we lost him. And the same goes for Eddie, you know. Uh, he really didn't have a chance to play much, you know, play. He only played three games, but... Uh, you know, his steady influence and his maturity helped us. You know, none, and I'm not necessarily talking about basketball-wise. We're just talking about personality-wise. Uh, their stability, you know, really helped us. Their maturity really helped us. And, you know, that kind of made you feel a little bit more comfortable than before. Oh, well, I don't, I don't really think it had a detrimental effect on us at all. I think, you know, it just pulled us closer together. And... Uh, you know, the knock on, you know, the Columbia team the whole year, we didn't have size and all of that, but, you know, it would have been nice to have, I guess, a legitimate big man, but, you know, we held our own on the boards, and, uh, you know, for me, it was fun playing without without a true big man, because, you know, we had we had a lot more mobility, 
and uh, a lot more freedom on offense and defense. As Gene Ben said, the Lions did have a lot of fun this year. They were in contention for the Ivy League title right down to the year's last buzzer. The last weekend was one the team's three seniors, Spence, Jeff Combs, and Mike Wilhite, had waited a career for. And despite the split, Shane Kotner and Jeff Combs were still pleased by their last weekend of the season. It was really up and down. Unbelievable. Uh, after Friday night, I was just so excited at uh, just at the fact that we'd beaten Penn and then at the fact that we had a chance to win the Ivy League. Just all of a sudden, we were thrust into that situation. And... Uh, it was, it's, it's really tough to, you know, I hate to alibi, but it's, it's so tough to, to come back after an emotional victory like that and, and, and play a game the next night, especially against a team like Princeton where you really have to be mentally prepared and uh, play a flawless game to beat them. And uh, I was depressed after the Princeton game, but it, it really didn't last too long because I, we had a lot to be proud of during the season. Nobody can... Uh express the how elated we all felt on the, the Penn victory, nor how frustrated or depressed we felt after the Princeton loss. But in retrospect, I, you know, I, st I wouldn't have traded victories. I think Penn, I would have rather beaten Penn than Princeton since we'd already beaten Princeton. With the Princeton loss eliminating the Lions from postseason play, Columbia had next year to look at. Shane Kartner can hardly wait. Big question mark. It really is. There's, there's so much... Uh it can happen. Uh, good freshman team coming up. I'm really optimistic about them. Uh, I think there are five or six players on that team that, that can really help us out a lot next year. Um, of course, the coaching is a question mark. I, I expect we'll have Buddy Moore, but I can't be certain. And, uh, of course, I can't be certain how well we'll play under him. And, uh, and now we have the freshman rule into effect. And uh, or out of effect. And, you know, there's no telling who we might get there. But I honestly think that with the talent that's, that's there now in the Ivy League that, that we're the favorite to win the Ivy League next year. I, I really honestly think we can win 20 games next year. 1977-1978, a year where Columbia beat Princeton for the first time in six years and Penn for the first time in nine. A year where they won eight in a row and lost eight straight. A year where they traveled across the country vainly looking for wins. A year in which Alton Bird was hurt, and the only big man quit the team. A year where they played 17 of 26 on the road, including 15 of their first 17. A year where they survived a bomb scare, a blizzard, and a fight. And a year where Columbia nearly won an Ivy League basketball title. It was certainly a year to be proud of. But thanks to John Metaxas and Mark Becker, this is Tom Mariam for WKCR Sports. excitement of NIT basketball is coming to WKCR-FM. This year, you'll hear some of the nation's finest college basketball teams face each other in two National Invitation Tournament doubleheaders right here at 89.9. On Sunday, March 19th, we'll bring you two exciting semifinal contests. And on Tuesday, March 21st, you'll hear the consolation and championship games. Tip-off both nights is at 6 o'clock, with the pregame show getting underway at 5.45. So join us on March 19th and March 21st for NIT Basketball, exclusively on WKCR-FM 89.9, New York's number one station for college sports. 
and in the NIT. Tomorrow night they have three of the quarterfinal games at the Rutgers Athletic Center in Piscataway. Indiana State and Larry Bird take on James Bailey and the Rutgers Scarlet Knights. At Dayton, Georgetown, who won the holiday festival at Madison Square Garden this year, taking on the Dayton Flyers. At North Carolina State, the Detroit Titans will be playing NC State. And then on Wednesday night, the Nebraska Cornhuskers visit the Longhorns of Texas. That should be quite a football game if they were to play, but it is for the NIT in basketball. The winners of those games advance to New York City and Madison Square Garden for the semifinals of the NIT. And as you heard a moment ago, you can hear the entire Madison Square Garden section of the NIT right here exclusively in New York on WKCR-FM. Airtime Sunday night for the semifinal doubleheader. 5.45 airtime for the Twine Time Show for the first game of the semifinal. The first game will come on with a broadcast at 5.55 and we'll go straight through until the second game of the evening. Same airtimes for the consolation game and finals on Tuesday, March 21st. That's a 5.45 Twine Time pregame show and a 5.55 time for the consolation game. The NIT here on WKCR-FM. Also, WKCR in 10 days will begin their baseball coverage. Columbia Lions baseball begins the northern swing against the Iona Gales at Hague Field in New Rochelle on March the 23rd, a Thursday at 2.45 p.m. We'll have the baseball pregame show for you at that time. And then at 2.55, the first pitch of the northern season, the Lions against the Iona Gales. Currently, the Columbia Lions are in Florida warming up for their northern season under their new head coach, Paul Fernandez. WKCR-FM 89.9, New York.